All right. Well, clearly I'm not an academic, unlike my three brilliant colleagues who went before me. So I'm just going to give you a little um, takeaway of what I, um, what I found when I went to Taiwan to interview its new president. It's new, the first woman president of Taiwan, uh, Tsai Ing-wen, in late July. Actually, oddly enough, during the Republican Convention. So I used to watch the Republican Convention in the morning and, you know, do my stuff later in the day. Anyway, she was extremely nice and had me over to dinner at, at her also modest apartment where she lived when she was a trade negotiator the night before the interview. And so she had me over with a couple of her very key aides, uh, her national security advisor and the, the head of his office, Vincent Chow. And um, so it was very nice because it was off the record and I guess she felt that she could be a bit more frank and so we, chat, we chatted about China, the, uh, the South China Sea, because as somebody said, one of the brilliant experts on this panel, the South China Sea arbitration ruling had just come down before I landed there. And um, she was taking a pretty hard line from our point of view on the South China Sea and on Taiping Island, which is, of course, uh, claimed by Taiwan. So then in the middle of dinner, uh, entertainingly enough, and per your comments, her advisor said, so, do you think there's any possibility that Donald Trump could be elected? <laughs> now, at that very point, Donald Trump was ahead of Hillary Clinton in the polls. So I said, um, actually, it looks like he could be elected. And I can't say that they were really thrilled by this news. And um, they sort of wanted to know, well, how do you think we could approach him? Who's going to be working for him? Which is, if you don't mind my saying so, with tonight's debate looming, uh, quite, still quite unknown, I think, as to who's around Donald Trump. I mean, you mentioned this Peter Navarro, who's constantly writing about trade, and there are um, hopefully a few other people that will <laughs> come to light, whereas we do know who uh, Mrs. Clinton's uh, aides are, like you mentioned Jake Sullivan, who's extremely intelligent and going to be head, or at least allegedly head of the National Security Council. Anyway, so, so much for the night before. It was a lot of fun. The apartment was very small, very modest by American standards. It was extremely nice of her to do it, very gracious of her. And then the next morning, I interviewed her at the um, official, help me out, the official palace, the official presidential, presidential, presidential office. office. I knew I'd get some help. Okay. <laughs> and so with, you know, officials lining, as they do in Asia, of course, lining, you know, by rank, of course, you know, to my right, they go down in order, of course. And so, um, and I thought she did a really, really good job. I thought she spoke well, she was confident, she knew what she was going to say. And so I'm just going to, for those of you who haven't had the pleasure of reading my interview, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about what she said. So we started off by um, discussing the, the fact that China had, uh, as, you, uh, as the experts mentioned, just cut off the, uh, the com uh, channels of communication, both the uh, direct um, channel of communication and the so-called semi-official semi channel, which is, um, um, if, correct me if I'm making any mistakes, but um, <laughs> huh? the Association for Relations Across the Taiwan Straits, good, good. known as ARITS, right? And Taiwan Straits Exchange Foundation. That, that, that's as good. I'm told by my tutors. Um, semi-official. Anyway, so in light of these events, which obviously is not great news, um, how was the president planning to uh, handle the cross-straits relations, I asked her, and how was she going to um, maintain the status quo, which, as you know, is a very important U.S. national, US national security interest. And, um, but yeah, because the one thing I would disagree with you about Trump is if he pulls the troops out of Japan, I don't think it's great news for Taiwan, right. but just mentioning. So the, pr the uh, president ins insisted, and uh, she insisted over and over again, that Taiwan had what she called diverse channels of communication with the mainland. Now, I, I um, pushed her in the sense that I said, OK, well, what are those channels exactly? And she was evasive, I would have to say, as many presidents are. But <laughs> she, um, anyway, she insisted that there were um, different levels of the government, is exactly what she said, have different ways of communicating with their counterparts in China. Um, so she didn't obviously specify if there were channels, if there weren't. And as one of the experts said, I understood before I went there that there was this crazy fact machine whereby if um, a Taiwan tourist or somebody or a businessman got arrested, they could send a fax and I guess the Chinese allegedly would know about it. 
But uh, that seems to me like a thin reed to lean on, but just my takeaway. Um, but she did say that she hoped we could, we, Taiwan, can gradually build up trust with Beijing, which I thought was helpful. And, um, and she also insisted that Taiwan had done its best to minimize its differences with the mainland and that, quote, we do not take provocative measures. Now, the main source of the, uh, the disagreement with the mainland, of course, is the mainland feels, as you know, that, um, and as my expert panelists have said, that uh, she should reiterate the uh, 92 uh, consensus or the one China policy, and she should have done this in her inaugural speech. And when she didn't do it, that's when they cut off the, um, the channels of communication. And so I asked her, of course, again, would, would she like to reiterate this? Would she like to say it? And of course, she didn't want to say it. Uh, she says things like it's historically true and sort of things around it. So she doesn't say it didn't never happen. She sort of, but um, so, but China wants her to say it explicitly, and she doesn't say it. So therein lies the problem. So um, then she. I asked her what did she think of, of China's president, Xi Jinping, and she said that she praised him for tackling corruption, but she also said, as one of my panelists said, that she hoped that President Xi Jinping was aware that the leader of a democratic country like herself has to follow, quote, the will of the people. Now, I don't know how, how much interest Xi Jinping has in following the will of the people, but <laughs> as mentioned. But anyway, she, she did come back to the theme of democracy, I would say, in the interview several times. And I also asked her about her youthful followers and who are, as we have said on the panel, more pro-independence than the, than the older members of the DPP and certainly of the opposition party. So how would she balance their wishes against the, um, the, the wishes of the others on the island? How would she maintain the status quo with considering that they're really an, anti, certainly marginally pro-independence, one might say, and as Stape, I think, said, uh, polls show them to be, consider themselves Taiwanese, not Chinese. So sh she said that all, her answer was all Taiwanese agree on the need both for democracy and for maintaining peace and stability in the region. So, um, I, and then I asked her, I, discuss, I asked her, did, did she think it was fair that the United States considers Taiwan an entity rather than a country? And then its four top officials are not allowed to come to Washington and can only come to <coughs> to certain U.S. cities on a negotiated basis when passing through the United States to another country. And this, of course, was the result of, of uh, what State was involved in in 1979 when the United States uh, recognized the uh, PRC as China. And uh, so she said that uh, indeed it was, this was unfair, she felt, and that the Taiwanese people felt they had a full government and a sound democratic mechanism, and therefore she felt that it was unfair. And one of her aides said the same thing at the dinner the night before, I've got to say. But, you know, I mean, they seemed to feel, okay, they had to deal with it, it was unfair, however, which it was interesting to hear her say that. Um, and as I said before, she refused to endorse the 92 consensus, according to which both, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, both Taiwan and, and China agreed that they're, well, at least the Taiwanese say that both, they, they agree that there's one China and the Taiwanese say with two different interpretations, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, I believe the Chinese don't have any such thing about two interpretations, <laughs> right? <laughs> anyway. So, um, okay, going you know, to her statement on the South uh, China Sea, um, as we said, um, as I said, before I got there, the arbitration panel had handed down their ruling and um, which meant that the fishing zone, obviously, so they said that the island of Taiping Island was, was, um, was anyway, they, apparently the Taiwanese didn't expect them to do the panel to deal with Taiping Island, but it did. So it meant that the fishing zone around the island went from 200 um, miles to 12 miles. And that I, I guess it was considered not an island, but a rock. So she was very upset about this, and she, there were pictures of her on a naval boat threatening to sail to the island and so on and so forth. And I, as far as I could see, her, her statement was very, very close to the Chinese, fairly hard line. And just one of her aides explained to me, after all, they can't really take an independent position on a piece of land, you know, because of course there's only one China, right? So therefore, um, 
although I understand that, that her, her uh, position was negotiated carefully, so that it was slightly, a tiny bit different, so people like on the stage would understand the tiny differences. I think she didn't object to the tribunal's um, rejection of the nine dash line, if I'm correct. But from a United States um, point of view, it looked very similar to the Chinese reaction to the arbitration panel. I mean, my editor actually emailed me, are you, are you actually making a mistake? You know what you're talking about. Is this really what she's saying? Because of course he was, he was thinking of Taiwan as more democratic, et cetera, et cetera. So he was like, well, what's this? You know, what's this answer? <laughs> so I'm trying to see. Good question. So, <laughs> well, I'll just mention. So I said, no, I'm not making a mistake. It's really what they're saying. So um, I would just end by saying back in 2011, uh, then candidate Tsai came to the White House. And she left a very poor impression. She left the White House officials very worried that um, because she claimed that she could negotiate an alternative to the one, one China policy. I think there are certain Taiwanese officials here in this room that don't see it this way, but this is the United States point of view. She told um, U.S. officials she would have to develop a consensus to deal with China. Uh, so the White House leaked the story and said that they did not have confidence in her. And uh, she lost that election. So she did bet. Since then, in, th in this particular reincarnation, she's been much more careful about what she said, certainly to U.S. officials, and I think at home, too. She's been much more careful about the status quo and so on and so forth. Um, her recent campaign, as you all know in this room, better than I do, was based on the promise that she can get the economy growing and that she can improve social services and um, raise wages. And now, of course, growth is under 1%, so it's kind of hard to see how this is going to happen. Moreover, she's um, said that she's going to diversify trade away from the mainland to Japan and to other countries. And I think there are at least people I talked to before I went were very skeptical about this. I personally don't have an opinion. I don't know enough. But I think they were skeptical, is this really going to work? Because so much of Taiwan's trade and investment was with the mainland. She argues that it's going to work because we're going to move away from manufacturing, and in, in fact, China's actually competing with us on manufacturing. As I said, I, I, don't, I don't have an opinion. I'm just reporting what, what she said. So it's interesting. It'll be interesting to see, does it work? Does it not work? Does the growth work? Because that a lot of her uh, campaign, as you know, was not based on one China policy. It was based on economic delivery. So um, as one of my fellow panelists said, the mainland could start giving her a really hard time by picking off her diplomatic allies, which are few and far between. And they've already picked off Gambia. And so I think she has to be careful. And she, you know, she didn't say that she was worried, but she said that, that her allies were very important to her. I think my panelists also mentioned there's been a, drop, a significant drop in both tourism and trade from China, which is clearly not a good thing for Taiwan. But as I, in closing, I would just like to say I thought she was very impressive, very thoughtful. Um, she, she said that she felt that she represents the people who want change and who, who want to place more emphasis on human rights and transparency. And she said that the KMT, the opposition party, had been pretty much under the KMT, that Taiwan had been a pretty much a authoritarian place, and she sees it more as a democracy. But as I said, I found her to be interesting, thoughtful, and um, I wish her luck. And it was a very interesting interview. Thank <laughs> you. Thank you.